Welcome to a new episode of the Excel Magazine podcast. My name is Diana Olenik, your host, and today we're going to be speaking with Trent Clue de Castella, who is the co-founder and CEO of the Australian-based XR studio Foria. Trent has a background in psychology and leads a team of 35 XR creators in Melbourne, where they have developed extensively across VR, AR, and MR, which stands for virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality, these type of immersive technologies, for the last eight years. In 2019, the team produced the award-winning AR Nature series Rewild with Netflix. In 2020, saw the launch of the award-winning VR Nature series Ecosphere, and in 2021, they were nominated for an Emmy Award for their cross-platform work with Meta and the Paralympics. Finally, last year, Trent and his team launched a world-first web XR mixed reality experience called Spatial Fusion on the MetaQuest Pro. This happened pretty much for the launch of the MetaQuest Pro. Trent believes that AR and NR are such a special and unique value to give purely in the ability to connect the user with their physical surroundings. He hopes AR can serve to deepen connections between people, places, and cultures. I cannot wait to begin this exciting interview. Let's do it. Thank you so much, Trent, for being here today. How is everything going with you today? Great. Yeah, wonderful to be here. Um, life is great right here, right now in Melbourne, Australia. It's summertime, the sun's shining, uh, lots of good activities to get out and soak up a lot of nature over the break. So, yeah, I went for a swim this morning and feeling really excited to dive into a conversation with you today. Uh, that's absolutely lovely. Thank you so much. So to get started, maybe we can discuss a little bit about your background and how Foria got started. Yeah, great. So um, yeah, my name is Trent Clues de Casella. I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO at Foria. So Foria is an XR studio based here in Melbourne. Um, there's about 40 Forians is what we call ourselves, um, and we kind of traverse this really exciting, new, and rapidly changing space yeah, of immersive technology. Um, our mission really is to, to pioneer evolving tech to try and understand how it can transform human experience. We see there's so much potential in these new mediums, um, and then also, you know, there's a lot of concern and, and fear about how they'll be used and so we try and walk a path that tries to shine a light on some of the positive use cases in this space and yeah it's been a fun journey we've been running for about uh coming up to our eighth year so it's been almost a decade and yeah our roots really started back in 2014 um, when we started to see the way that we were exploring the internet was changing and we were ju all jumping on you know our smartphones to browse the web and then we started to think about um, how we can, you know, explore places all around the world and maybe there's some new and more experiential ways to do that. And so that sort of planted a little bit of a seed of curiosity in the early days where we were looking at 3D scanning and how we can virtualize environments and transport ourselves into these spaces. Um, so, yeah, it's been a really fun journey. And I think it really also feels like we're only just getting started. So, yeah, excited to dive in deeper with you today. Oh, thank you so much. It seems that when it comes to speak about 2D, maybe correct me if I am wrong, you also work for a highlighted project, Rewild, from Netflix. Mm -hmm. How was that yeah. experience? Was it just 2D? Uh, no, yeah. So I guess um, we, we've had a few really amazing natural history theme projects and um, really one of the first breakthrough moments for us was in about, uh, 2018, um, Google reached out to us. They were working on a project in partnership with the World Wildlife Fund, WWF, um, and then also Netflix and a production unit called Silverback Films. And so this is a new documentary series with David Attenborough called Our Planet. And 
yeah, what was exciting here was they wanted to explore how they could actually take the 2D content and then have it break off the screen. You know, we were talking about um, maybe imagine, you know, watching a rainforest, you know, on a screen in front of you and then seeing an orangutan jump out and run around and maybe climb up a tree next to you. And so that really, I think, was the pretty exciting kind of early stages for mobile AR. Um, a new feature had just come out around um, spatial anchors or cloud anchors that enabled multiple users to then connect in and have a shared experience. And so Rewild effectively was, was this idea where we took the themes of each episode, um, which was focused on these biomes, which was the rainforest, the oceans, um, the frozen landscapes, and then um, just forests as well. So we, we wanted to try and explore how we could create new types of um, storytelling in a social environment. And so the result was actually um, an immersive installation that activated in New York and Singapore and Bristol in the UK. And the way that it works is you basically walk in, um, you're given a, a smartphone device that's in a little handheld grip, and then a group of about 10 people kind of embark on this journey where they see um, really the, the planet in front of them and then they get to work together to vote where they want to go. Do they want to go check out the rainforest in Borneo or do they want to go um, hang out with some, you know, elephants, maybe in some savanna grasslands. And so from there, um, it was really interesting to see how AR could not only bring strangers together, but then all of a sudden as a medium, they're actually working together to determine which episode they wanted to experience. And then the magical moment is really we, we witnessed, um, you know, in front of you, you see, you know, these amazing rainforests, like a bird's eye view. And then all of a sudden you see on the screen, you know, things like illegal deforestation, you know, just pollution, climate change. And then all of a sudden the forest starts burning away at your feet. And then um, following up from that, you're invited to rewild and embrace some of the positive actions that WWF were promoting at the time, which is, you know, looking at some interesting things like even drone technology to seed and automate um, rainforest restoration projects. And then through that process of what's happening in 2D on the screen, you actually are actually rewilding that ecosystem around you and restoring that balance and then after um, that is restored then you have a wildlife encounter where nature then comes back and so yeah pretty pretty fun and exciting project um, it, it won um, best use of AR at the Webby's which is really exciting and opened up a whole bunch of exciting applications that flowed from that as well that kind of extended beyond augmented reality but yeah a really wonderful project um, and then the, the magic that we saw at the end of it all was was when we handed over the project to some of the partners at these venues uh, the facilitators actually were science educators and also WWF ambassadors and then all of a sudden they realized that augmented reality had a whole new means to engage the audience you could see how dialed in especially the kids were in the, the experience and then all of a sudden at the end um, whilst the experience ended it actually just started a conversation you know you see parents getting challenged by their kids around the actions that, that you know we take and make on a, on a daily basis and so yeah it sort of shined a, a, a glimmer of hope into how more immersive and engaging content that gives a user agency and educates them along the journey can actually be used as a really powerful educational tool to hopefully drive change. So, yeah, that was a, a wonderful project to be a part of. Wow, that sounds amazing. I'm very curious to know what type of tools did you use to make this happen? Did you use uh, Unity, Unreal, or what, what tools did you use? Yeah, definitely. So I guess um, maybe like starting from the beginning in terms of workshopping and creating concepts you know we'll, we'll always sort of start with story first and um we we're pretty fortunate looking at like the timelines of these videos that um, netflix had supplied and we kind of use this as a bit of a framework to then go okay what kind of user interactions come up and how do we prototype some of these concepts and so we do a lot of rapid prototyping so we jump straight into to unity um and then started developing out these like user interactions, you know, what does it feel like to rewild? How do we vote, you know, spatially? So um, yeah, Unity is an amazing tool to unlock a lot of these pieces. Um, 
And so from there, yeah, when we were publishing it, um, in time, Unity started to roll out, um, I guess, the ability to distribute it across Android and iOS. So having, um, you know, scalable frameworks, I think, make, made it really appealing to take what we initially launched in a museum and then actually just put it up on the App Store, both Android and iOS App Store, kind of at the click of a button. So, yeah, definitely Unity was the main game engine that we were developing in and then a whole bunch of 3D art programs, Maya, and then playing with um, different elements to animate some of the animals and creature encounters and a whole bunch of technical art the team were, were building as well. I find very inspiring that I believe your background is in psychology. Is that correct? But mm -hmm. you seem to have an, a nice depth and all the skills for also the technicals of this. How, th how, that this, how did this happen, actually? Yeah, I appreciate that you've done your research there. Um, personally, like my, my, my passion, I think, is, is very much around human connection. Oh, um, so I was always interested in technology as a kid. But then when obviously it was, came to university and trying to choose a degree um, in the early days, you know, wasn't really much at any of the universities in terms of you know game development game design um xr vr probably wasn't even on anyone's radar at that point um in the academia landscape and so yeah i, I gravitated naturally towards psychology as my vocation um thinking about positive psychology so yeah behavioral change thinking about how we can yeah really just kind of support maybe you know different minorities or those that just need a helping hand and um, got to the end of my degree and, and sort of found myself at a, a crossroads, um, you know, like many of us asking, where do we go next, right? And saw this, you know, emerging nascent industry. Um, initially sort of was curious in like 3D content, was looking at the idea of, you know, if I could model something, I could 3D print it. And that was really fascinating. And then quickly found um, 3D modeling is, is hard, I think, for a lay person and saw like 3D scanning as an emerging tool. And so saw all these little 3D elements bubbling up. Um, and so I guess at that point I realized, hey, um, I can always come back to uni and complete my studies, but this felt like it was the beginning crest of a really exciting wave. So I figured let's, yeah, pull up a, a surfboard and, and, and give it a go and see if we can make something of it. So it was sort of a... A fun, fun pivot, to say the least. Um, but, yeah, still very much sort of thinking about how the human psychology, you know, comes into the experience design. Um, and then, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely a novice still on the technical level, like the our team technical leads, yeah, can teach, um, teach me so much every day. So I still have a lot to learn in, in both fields. But it's been fun navigating this middle path, and I think it's really helped in terms of the the values and, and purpose, you know, at our studio and what we actually want to do, you know, with our time and gifts. Yes, amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that part of your own story and how it is actually linked with the work that is happening right now. I'd like to also discuss a little bit about Ecosphere because it's an experience that actually has that element of social impact, which we love so much to talk about it. And I actually believe that there is not enough of these type of initiatives in the world. So I'm so happy to have the opportunity to dive into that. Please let us know a little bit more about Ecosphere and if you'd like to uh, showcase, for example, the particular case with Colombia and how was building this experience, things that you learn, et cetera, any, anything. Yeah, great. I appreciate it. Um, so after Rewild, we, we were at uh, South by Southwest and um, just, you know, connecting with different stakeholders and, um, I, uh, my brother-in-law was working at Meta or, or Facebook at the time and I was sharing Rewild as a project and he was like, oh, you should connect with the immersive media team at Oculus. And so, yeah, one conversation led to another and found myself, um, yeah, chatting to the, the head of immersive media, Eric Cheng, an amazing wildlife photographer, actually, like he's got some amazing content under his belt and, um, he was just saying to your exact point, like there's there's not enough of this content out there, right? Like when people think of VR, people might go to a zombie game or a roller coaster yeah. ride. You know, yeah. it's definitely the kind of staple ingredients of of what the current you know VR landscape kind of constitutes. And so, 
we really were like, okay, well, well Rewild is, is such an amazing project. You know, how do we take some of the, the themes and, and, and the message and the intentions behind, yeah, natural history, storytelling in an immersive way, and then feed it into virtual reality. And so we actually took um, some of the relationships that we already had from Rewild. So we ran a workshop with our partners at the WWF and then also Silverback Films that, you know, one of the world's best natural history production units out there. And so we were like, okay, obviously filming um, animals, you know, in 2D is, is an art. And, you know, the cameras, they have every camera under the sun to capture an animal 600 meters away. You know, if you were to try and achieve something like that with 360 camera, it'd probably be like three pixels <laughs> in the distance. Um, so how do we plan trying to get close and personal in an intimate way with you know these amazing creatures um and they're not just the animals also you know the the custodians of these ecosystems you know those that are dedicating their lives to protecting these amazing biomes and so we we quickly um detailed out like three episodes um in the rainforest in the savannas in, in kenya and then also in um, the reefs in Indonesia or Raja Ampat is this amazing place. And so we detailed that out. Um, and then this fortunately was was pre-pandemic. So we we're able to go out and send a pretty small crew in the scheme of things. But yeah, produced some amazing natural history content um, on some prototype cameras. So we actually at that point were looking at VR 180 as an actual sweet spot between the traditional approach of being, you know, 2D direction behind the camera and then 360 where often it feels like I'm going to like drop the camera here and run behind the tree and hit record and hopefully I, I get a shot. Hopefully an animal comes up, you know, walks past and you, you lose a lot of that control. Um, and, yeah, so we, we sort of found 180 was, was emerging um, and we, we started looking at some of these new prototype cameras that were coming into the market. And so we could actually get um, cinema level VR content stereo with perfect um, IPD, which is the interpupillary distance. So same human stereo vision at a really high resolution. Um, and then we could mount the cameras in places where you could get up and close, um, really close, you know, with orangutan and with little baby elephants coming up, uh, with manta rays, you know, swimming over the top of you. And so we we had, um, yeah, an amazing production team behind that project. Our um, co-founder and experiential director, Joseph Purdom, was the director for the series. And then we have an amazing producer and, and writer and change maker, Angie Davis. And so those two really shaped a, a narrative with some of the key stakeholders on the ground um, to really just connect. And what you quickly found through Ecosphere as a medium, so many people still comment on um, that really sense of just presence when you're sitting in front of someone, whether it be, you know, a Maasai elder or maybe the first, you know, female ocean ranger in um, Indonesia, all of a sudden it feels like when they're talking to you, when they're talking to the camera, there's like a human connection, you know, it feels like it's heart to heart and that ultimate sense of presence, I think really drives home um, some of the key messages in the same way that, you know, is akin to being there. And so yeah, as, a, as a series, it's an amazing title. Um, it's got about a million downloads on the Oculus app store and, probably about double that in terms of views across different channels at the moment. Um, we've been able to push it into different formats like um, projection domes and things like that. And so it's been good to get that out. And then um, about 2020, we were contacted by the United Nations. And so they reached out, they saw Ecosphere and they were wanting to create a um, film about the impact of climate change on the Asia Pacific region. And specifically how, you know, these extreme events were impacting, you know, security and, and safety in a way where, you know, you can imagine islands like um, Kiribati or Vanuatu, you know, the writing is on the wall in terms of rising sea levels. And so they um, reached out and were like, let's, let's produce a series that dives into how a lot of the solutions are actually being led on a grassroots level 
by the community. And so that that was an amazing film to produce, um, albeit quite challenging to produce in the middle of a pandemic. It, we were the first production crew to get into Fiji to film after the pandemic. Um, and so that actually expanded from Sea of Islands, which is the, the feature on um, the Asia-Pacific region, and then incorporated a, a series of other titles. So there's a, a three-part series set in Colombia and the similar theme. So this was actually led by um, the UN Department of Political Peacebuilding Affairs. And so they really want to focus on um, the human story and how, you know, the resilience is, is coming through in different forms and capacities. And so, um, yeah, a lot of the, the change in the region of Colombia that is seen in, in recent years and how that's being led by both the, the government but on a, a grassroots community level. Um, and so it's been amazing to kind of see the UN really embrace these tools and mediums. And then that's also extended into a new film um, that's recently released in Yemen with similar threads there around conflict and security. And so, yeah, Ecosphere as a platform, we, we hope it can actually continue to grow to be almost like the, the Netflix of VR for impact stories. And we hope that these stories connect people to the wildest places and also, you know, the most meaningful cultures and human-led stories. And so, yeah, hopefully we can continue to grow that. So if you have any ideas for future stories, um, we would love to hear. Wow, such a great experience. Because also I'm super excited because it happens that I am originally from Colombia. <laughs> So that's where I am from. So for me, it's like, wow, it's such a beautiful. I'm going to be sharing this in all social media, in all channels, because, of course, I have a little bit of my heart in the project. I know how it is the conflict because I live most of my life there, or how it was, how it was to live in the actual uh, difficult situation. And I'm so glad that a company and, and productions from other parts of the world have came to showcase the reality of that story and the impact that it has made in the communities around. So thank you for sharing that. It seems you also have something related, um, like a, a story there related with Fiji and the climatic change. Is that correct? Yep. Yes, that's called Sea of Island. What has been the most, like the biggest challenge in these type of productions? And what have you, like, what did you use to overcome them? Yeah, really, really good question. I guess. Um... In recent times, it definitely the, the the greatest challenge is which is physical access to the areas. So um, we had to produce Sea of Islands, you know, in the middle of the pandemic, and so we initially set like a, a twelve month timeline to scope up the pre production and plan to get access into Fiji and Vanuatu and a few different countries in the area because we wanted to tell a much more regional story. Um, and then it was it was virtually impossible, as we know, like travel internationally was just tied up. Um, and so that that was a, a massive challenge. And then the next natural approach was, OK, well, maybe we could work with local production partners on the ground. You know, maybe we could train them remotely, send in the hardware and then they could go out and produce it. Um, and then, you know, admittedly, VR and 360 and 180 filmmaking, there is still a big steep learning curve and so it was a little bit risky to try and deliver something of the quality that we wanted to maintain without having work with the crew or have someone to then kind of support them and so yeah we eventually got access into the region in Fiji um, and whilst we had a small crew of about three people because it was the first production in the country they really wanted to abide by a lot of you know COVID protocol and safety measures and so we had 17 <laughs> government delegates um, assigned to the production to oversee that we were actually, you know, operating, you know, professionally and safely. And so all of a sudden it really ballooned in terms of the complexity. You know, we had a small boat that we commissioned to drive around to the old um, cruise around to these other islands. And then all of a sudden we had to get a large research vessel just to sherpa everyone around. So some of those pieces behind the scenes are some pretty, pretty funny stories that um, you just can't anticipate. And then I think, yeah, more more broadly, um, production's one, but as as a lot of us in the film, VR filmmaking space would know, the amount of post-production is, is often, you know, really, I think, varied. And it comes down to the hardware that you use, 
um, even just the positioning when you're producing it, so how close the subject is to the camera. Um, all of our films are, are stereo, so we want to make sure that it is really comfortable, it looks really nicely and neatly aligned. And so the, the lion's share of the work really is in post-production and trying to dial up the quality where every frame is, is really crisp and nice and accurate and high resolution and um, the grade and all these other elements that go in like you would traditional cinema. So a lot of love and detail goes in, into the work, but I think it definitely you know speaks for itself when you see um, things like Sea of Ireland being demoed at, um, you know, Davos or the UN General Assembly when we, you know, aspirationally were like, imagine, you know, if we could get these stories, say, from Colombia into the room of key decision makers that are actually able to write into law, you know, actions and initiatives and programs and legislature that can actually have an immense change, you know, not just on an individual or a community um, but a country. And so I think that's definitely been amazing to kind of see that translate and kind of reach people where they're at in a way that can hopefully drive, you know, really positive impact. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. I believe that having this type of social experiences, as I said at the beginning, we really appreciate the opportunity that you are giving also to other creators in the world to share those stories, because the only way that these can really expand and uh, maybe make the, the mission even like more accessible for others and to really understand and know about these experiences to inform more the society is through these strategies of uh, upscaling. And I think that this uh, generated content that other creators can uh, help you to to make for the platform is uh, a great way for you to bring the message even to wider uh, communities and around other countries. So thank you so much for sharing that. I really appreciate Ecosphere. Of course, I am inviting everybody to go and check it out. We are going to uh, make a couple of videos just like to showcase how, how this actually works and tag you. Uh, as I mentioned, we are very, we are very happy to to be sharing this uh, with anybody. And Great. on the other note, you also have other super fun experience that is called spatial fusion. Please let us know a little bit more about it. Yeah, great. Um, and just just to tie off the the last point, like um, hundred percent, like this whole landscape and industry is such an open playing field where. Um, we're all in it together and I think we are all these kind of co-creators co right so even um, the recent work with the UN there was other filmmakers that have actually created content that we've also managed to promote through Ecosphere as a platform and so definitely I think that approach is is quite um, refreshing in relation to yeah maybe how like traditional industries would operate I think there's a, a much greater propensity and openness to collaboration and to co-create and so it's yeah exciting to kind of be pushing the envelope in that way um, but yeah to, to Spatial Fusion so Spatial Fusion is our, our latest uh, mysterious kind of odd little immersive uh, narrative so we initially were approached by uh, Meta's WebXR team and so we worked with them last year on a WebXR browser-based experience called RAW with the International Paralympics Committee. So this experience was really trying to push how um, WebXR is enabling the ability for, you know, storytellers and brands to create experiences that can go onto desktop, onto mobile, onto virtual reality. And so that was an amazing project. We actually got nominated um, for an Emmy for this small series that we made. And mm -hmm. um, it's amazing to kind of see these incredible human stories kind of, you know, elevated in a way experientially where all of a sudden, you know, in virtual reality, you're sitting next to this athlete and hearing how they've overcome adversity at key defining moments in their lives. And so that was a really beautiful VR experience. And then um, fast forward sort of 12 months after that, um, Meta was leading into Meta Connect and the launch of the Quest Pro, which, as we know now, has, you know, really amazing mixed reality pass through feature. And they were also wanting to see how mixed reality could actually run over the web. So um, the same team hit us up and were like, hey, we've got all these new features. We want to see how 
creators like Foria can actually produce experiences where stuff maybe incorporates your room setup. So maybe if I wanted to bounce objects off the wall or maybe how the um, spatial anchors work. So I maybe start the experience, take my headset off and come back and then everything realigns and reconnects and embeds contextually, you know, where you previously left it. Um, and so then from there, we, we basically partnered with a really awesome web studio coming out of Bristol called Lusion and a wonderful sound design team called Zelig Sound. And so we, from the ground up, all um, in sort of 3JS, so custom build, built out a fun interactive science fiction story. Um, at that point, we were sort of noticing a lot of the interest in this idea of fusion energy, right? Like the future of clean energy and, you know, this kind of dream where maybe we put in a little bit and then all of a sudden we can create infinite energy. And then um, we're also sort of, thinking about um, how we shape a story where we are a little bit cheeky in the narrative. So rather than trying to be hardcore science, we like science fiction that's almost like Futurama or Buzz Lightyear aesthetic where it's a little bit um, the art style's chunky and it's not trying to be too futuristic, but it's a little bit more playful and fun. And so we, our creative director, Ryan um, Roslin, came up with this idea of spatial fusion where you basically open a portal or a rift um, in your room and then all of a sudden all this space debris starts flying out from another dimension mm -hmm. and you unlock this um, stellarator which is like a gravity gun and basically you, you harness the power of fusion energy to um, clean up your room basically and rebuild this spaceship and this spaceship um, kind of has this little sentient AI in there that's talking you through what you need to do and then all of a sudden once you rebuild the spaceship you jump inside um, and that's the beauty of what we can now do with mixed reality pass through where all of a sudden there's a spaceship in my room and then I teleport inside the spaceship and then I'm in virtual reality and I'm inside a spaceship and we use um, the room dimension. So then the spaceship actually dynamically changed as big or as small as your physical room. And so all of a sudden you could see, you know, a fusion reactor just right behind you and the control panel. And so that sort of dynamic personalization of the experience to then actually activate and align to your space is a really amazing, I think, kind of wow card for, for creators and developers out there. Um, and then also just seeing mixed reality in this way over the web, it was just a light bulb moment where we recognized mixed reality has arrived, right? Like we built this pretty, pretty fun and exciting and just fun technical showcase, but then it's really shown us as a studio that, that MR is actually um, no longer like next horizon. It's now broken into the mainstream. And then with pass through, we now have the best of VR and AR. So I think as a, creator and a storyteller now we can build even more robust and immersive and engaging experiences mm -hmm. that's amazing thank you for sharing that so just to clarify somebody with a quest pro can immerse themselves with this experience using mixed reality of course and how about web xr can they actually check it out also through the through the web like, yep. Yeah. So, so it works on Quest Pro and Quest Two. Uh -huh. So we optimized it for both both devices, um, and then hopefully we'll plan to open it up to more more VR headsets as well in the near future with mixed reality support. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Web XI. So it all runs over the web. Um, uh -huh. So it is you just basically load up SpatialFusion.io, uh -huh. trigger the experience, and jump in in mixed reality. If you're on your phone or um, yeah, desktop computer, laptop, it's it's almost um, we've just pulled some of the assets from the main experience and embedded it as um, more of like a product interaction. So mm -hmm. kind of playing with the the narrative, we this gravity gun called the Stellarator, we were sort of framing it like it was um, a, a kind of product showcase, like a retail experience. And so you can imagine unlocking the power of fusion energy to do all these, you know, fantastical things and you can interact with that product and do a deep dive. And then we're also able to push that same asset out onto um, Instagram. So we push it through Spark AR. And so all of a sudden we had an AR experience, desktop, mobile and mixed wow. reality all running off the same content base. Everything, <laughs> everywhere. That's amazing. So uh -huh. where do you see this going then? I mean, are you allow creators to, to do stuff like that there for this one or, or where is it going? 
Yeah, awesome question. I wish we had another hour or podcast to dive into that. Um, <laughs> I guess the currently at Foria, where we, we see it all heading, we're talking about um, ultimately how media and storytelling is kind of crossing many boundaries, right? So typically, say, ecosphere, it's a linear video, right? So you're kind of sitting there and looking around, but you're kind of watching something on the timeline. And then game engines, like, you know, you have six degrees of freedom or maybe you have more interactivity, but you might not have, you know, the same quality as a 360 video. And so they've sort of been running in, in their own tracks. And what we see happening in the future or really right now is actually this um, approach where they start to, to mesh and, and weave together to unlock different ways of storytelling. So this typically is, is known as transmedia storytelling. So the idea that you can use many different media types across multiple different platforms. And so we, we call it internally at Foria spatial storytelling, where we have all this spatial information and spatial computing. We're able to experience things in a whole new way. And so at the moment, we're working towards um, a bit of a prototype that's a, a journey that's helping us understand how as storytellers we can shape these new types of experiences in mixed reality. And so we've created um, a prototype of something um, set in the oldest rainforest in the world. It's called the Daintree Rainforest in Queensland here in Australia. And all of a sudden, you're in the middle of this amazing waterfall and then you can see little beacons, you know, beckoning around you and move freely up to these points of interest and then trigger these content deep dives. So you might trigger something where all of a sudden you're an ant and then you see macroscopic views of mushrooms and um, plant life in a whole new perspective or maybe then um, stylized elements where we can see how the fungi is mycelium network goes through the ground and so we could do stylized elements um, or maybe a 360 drone lift shot where you kind of come up above the waterfall and you're floating over the whole rainforest um, or maybe simply just video where you go on a journey in 2d in you know large kind of imax style screen through the rainforest out along the river to the reef which is the great barrier reef and so for us um yeah playing with this idea of spatial storytelling and thinking about how mixed reality now can play so many different formats in a way that you know like i shared is 2d is 3d is 360 is 180 is amazing spatial audio um and then thread threading them together to then give people control in a more like choose your own adventure style but then still have um, really like a bit of an encompassed timeline where you can jump through to these different content types along the way. So we'll be demoing um, our first version of that at South by Southwest and really curious if any of your, your listeners out there wanted to jump in and say hello and have a conversation and try it out and see what they think. Because, yeah, we, we hope in a way um, we can set these up as, as installations as well because I think coming out of the pandemic we're all digitally native you know we've been through a digital awakening now and so I think these new types of entertainment that people are hungry for is these blended you know I'm going out for a physical experience that's then extended through some immersive layer and we've seen them with a lot of projection mapping and all these other elements um, that are quite passive and so we see maybe we can do some whole new things now with mixed reality that weren't even possible and so hopefully um, we can just simply transport people to the wildest places in the world connect them with nature maybe help them realize you know that the natural world is all around us we don't need to go to the tropical rainforest and then also weave in these threads of positive actions that we could take from that you know what do we need to do to protect you know the oldest rainforest in the world um, and trying to empower them with some, you know, information that is actually going to drive a positive action flowing off that. So, yeah, that's that's sort of the the pulse of of Fourier and and where at least we see ourselves heading um, in the near term. But yeah, it's definitely a fun fun ride. So maybe we should circle back in six months and see how much has changed. Especially thinking about um, Apple and some new you know players coming into the XR sector. I think it's going to be. A big moment uh, when Apple drop a, a headset. I feel oh, like yeah. bring bring a whole bunch of uh, naysayers to the party. So, looking forward to that. 
Yeah, and also light cheap, or I mean, uh, releasing like the glasses, like the augmented reality glasses that are going to allow people to now, you know, access this more in a way that is more amazing with it, not with, only with the cell phone. So that is going to be amazing. And of course, you're there at the forefront of all of this change. That has been such an amazing talk. I actually don't want to end it, but I know that Trent is super busy and very kindly and with his spirit of service has been able to share all of these beautiful insights and journey with us. Trent, I don't have more words to say because I'm speechless with all uh, your journey. Particularly, I like to highlight like your background that is so amazing and inspiring for many people, how you've been able to assemble the teams, to dive into technology when, like you have the mind of an artist, you have the mind of the creator, and that is something amazing. So learning from you, it's a delight. And I also would like to invite anybody to check all of these experiences and to be there, um, maybe seeing the, the news that are happening with Euphoria because very, very exciting things are coming up. And of course, this the most important thing that I want to say is that your approach is in the sense of the social impact and also how by the means of entertainment, you can also educate people. And I think that that's a very special mission. Again, I want to say, I haven't seen many of these type of initiatives and those are the initiatives that I really, my heart are in these initiatives a lot. Um, we should also wake up to these and support these type of experiences because they are so unique and really waken, awaken a tap to our humanity. So mm. thank you so much, Trent. Is there anything else that you wish I had asked you today? Uh, I've been really grateful and, and thankful for the opportunity to share parts of our story and yeah those are really humbling kind words yeah it definitely feels like humanity is coming up to the biggest challenge of our time and we need to think outside the box and change I think our approach and it just feels fitting that we have these amazing tools and instruments that can reach people in the most profound ways and so, yeah, I really encourage all of your listeners out there to just think about that because, yeah, these these are gifts and I, and I look forward to seeing how other change makers around the world harness them um, to really drive some of this progressive positive action that we need. And, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for the challenge. I feel like we're up for it and really, really kind of, yeah, just thankful for the opportunity to share parts of our story today. Um, yeah, by all means, all of our experiences we spoke about today are out on um, app stores and are free. So I recommend checking them out. Spatial Fusions over the web, spatialfusion.io. Uh, feel free to track us on social media, um, foria.io across most channels. Um, yeah, we, we love sharing fun, weird and wonderful things that kind of, you know, keep our curiosity alive and, and you know, excited. So, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Really grateful for it, Diana. Thank you so much, Trent. And please consider subscribing, sharing this episode with your friends if you found it interesting and insightful, which I believe it is. Thank you so much and see you in the next episode. Bye for now. Yeah. Bye.